Good afternoon and welcome everyone to today's update on COVID-19 in New Brunswick. Bonjour tout le monde et bienvenue à cette mise à jour sur le COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick. Les porte-parole pour le gouvernement provincial aujourd'hui sont la médecin hygiéniste en chef, la Dr. Jennifer Russell, et le premier ministre, Blaine Higgs. Speaking on behalf of the province today are the province's chief medical officer of health, Dr. Jennifer Russell, and the premier, Blaine Higgs. We'll now begin with Dr. Russell. Good afternoon, everyone. These daily briefings play an important part in our ongoing effort to stem the tide of the COVID-19 pandemic in New Brunswick. This is where New Brunswickers receive the information they need to protect themselves and their families. I want you to be able to trust the information we are providing, which is why I have placed a premium on telling the truth and being transparent. That is not always easy to do. There are hard truths to tell in this situation, and there will be days when I will have sad news to deliver. And in fact, last night when I got home from work, my daughter asked me, Mommy, you look really sad. Did you have a bad day? Did someone die? And I said, no, nobody died today. So no, it wasn't a bad day. We will have these days in the future and we do have to be prepared for that. But yesterday was not one of those days. We have to balance the public's right to know with the individual's right to privacy. I want to assure you that we are working hard to keep everyone informed and provide accurate and credible information to the public. And sometimes we do get hard questions that are sometimes challenging to answer simply because there are so many people who are involved in the efforts to respond to this pandemic right now. All across the healthcare system, all across the Department of Health, our partners with uh, the medical society, the RHAs, the unions, we have many conversations with all of our partners on a daily basis, along with our partners at Public Health Agency of Canada, who are in contact with the World Health Organization and also our counterparts in other jurisdictions. So there is a huge network of people working very, very diligently. And since we started our emergency operations procedures, we have people working seven days a week, 12 hour shifts, maybe sometimes 14 hour shifts every single day working on every single intricate detail and intricate part of how we are responding currently and how we plan to respond moving forward. Whether it's A and B, whether it's EMP, whether it's 811, whether it's clinical services, et cetera. All of these details are being looked after. So my commitment to you is that I will tell the truth even when the truth hurts and that's difficult. And what I need from you is a similar commitment to tell the truth. And by that, I mean, make sure that you have credible information, that you are using credible sources of information. Our GNB website, Public Health Agency of Canada, the World Health Organization, all of these places are very, very credible sources of information. So I would like people to refrain from spreading rumors and spreading things on social media unnecessarily. We are all gonna to be touched by COVID-19. We're all gonna have relatives and friends and colleagues and community members who are gonna be touched by this. And any kind of harassment and shaming that happens is not healthy and not productive. And it's, it's really not how we would want to see our citizens behave. So ensure that your information comes from credible sources. Today, there are 10 new confirmed cases of COVID-19 in the province, which brings our current total to 91. This includes the first confirmed case in zone seven, the Miramichi region. And I just have a clarification around that. Um, one of my colleagues, Dr. Nicole Leblanc, who is the chief of staff for Vitalité, uh, who I'm in touch with regularly, and Dr. John Dornan, who is the chief of staff for uh, Horizon, who I'm also in touch with very regularly. Um, Dr. Nicole Leblanc uh, wanted me to clarify the testing. And uh, it was around one of the cases in, I believe it was Karakat, yesterday and she was talking about the fact that the public was confused around the issue around postal codes and where people lived versus where they got tested. So our new testing I mentioned yesterday 
you will the, the case the testing is reported based on the location you have been tested not necessarily where you live so dr leblanc really wanted me to pass that message along because she had some people that were concerned about about um about the cases up north and and just making sure that people understand that a person who where they are tested is not necessarily where they live so new confirmed cases are as follows in zone two which is the saint john region there is one new case, an individual aged 70 to 79. In zone three in the central region, there are six new cases, three individuals aged 20 to 59, and three individuals aged 50 to 69. In zone four in the northwest region, there are two new cases, two individuals aged 70 to 79. And in zone seven, Miramichi region, there are one, there's one new case, an individual aged 20 to 29. And it is vital that every New Brunswicker maintain their physical distance and avoid mass gatherings. And it has come to our attention that um, there is a community involving a church that it, uh, has tested, has individuals who have tested positive. Uh, five individuals from that church have tested positive. Je vous demande que vous aussi de prendre un tel engagement à l'égard de la vérité. Méfiez-vous de ce que vous voyez dans les médias sociaux. Évitez de faire courir les rumeurs et assurez-vous que l'information que vous partagez provient de sources fiables. Aujourd'hui, j'annonce qu'il y a 10 nouveaux cas confirmés de COVID-19 au Nouveau-Brunswick, portant le total pour la province à 91 cas. Un premier cas a été confirmé dans la zone 7, sur la région de Miramichi. Les nouveaux cas confirmés sont répartis comme suit. Il y a un nouveau cas dans la zone 2, la région de St. John, soit un individu âgé entre 60 et 79. Il y a six nouveaux cas dans la zone 3, région centrale, soit trois individus âgés entre 20 et 59 ans et trois individus, individus âgés entre 50 et 69 ans. Il y a deux nouveaux cas dans la zone 4, région du nord-ouest, nord il y a euh, soit deux individus âgés entre 70 et 79 ans. Il y a un nouveau cas dans la zone 7, région de Miramichi, soit un individu âgé entre 25 et 29 ans. Et quand, que je, quand que je rapport, donne le rapport sur les cas, c'est des individus, c'est des individus avec des familles, des mères, des pères, des parents, des grands-parents, des enfants, des cousines, des tantes, des oncles. C'est des gens qui demeurent ici au Nouveau-Brunswick et on devrait prendre soin de eux comme nous, on, voulait être, on voudrait être soignés. Alors, je veux vous dire que oui, j'annonce des nombres de cas, mais ce sont des personnes, ce sont des humaines que nous partageons la province avec et on devrait respecter leur confidentialité. It's, il est absolument crucial que chaque Néo-Brunswickoise et chaque Néo-Brunswickois maintiennent une distance physique avec les autres et évite le rassemblement de masse. Un des cas confirmés met en cause une église communautaire de la province où cinq personnes infectées ont pris part à des activités. Public Health is taking steps to inform the church community and will remain in regular contact with those who are at risk of being infected. So just as we've, we've talked about the process before around how cases are identified and then um, diagnosed and then the contacts are traced, in the regions, our medical officers of health and our public health nurses are the ones who do these investigations and they are the ones who do the contact tracing. And if there is a public exposure, then I would be announcing that publicly. But in this particular case, it's a church community where all the members of the church were notified. So uh, in, in terms of an exposure and what the instructions are for that population. So this is an example of the steps that we take to limit the spread of the virus. So obviously having emergency measures in place and having mass gatherings limited is very, very important. So. This is, a, this is an example of exactly why, and we've seen cases in Newfoundland and we've seen cases in other parts of the country where as a result of mass gatherings, there have been several cases and contacts of cases that then became infected. So it's very, very important to follow the advice and the rules that we have put in place right now to protect all of us, including our healthcare workers. When we obtain important information for the public, we will share it as quickly as possible. And it is equally important that New Brunswickers share information based on credible and trusted sources. So I was asked about an airline flight yesterday uh, with, and I think that 
there was an impression that that hadn't been reported by public health or we had no knowledge of that. And when we look back at our dates in the flights that we have announced, it actually was part of that list. So to avoid confusion moving forward, we will make sure that that information is available on our website. And so people will know where to find it and they can see it for, uh, for the purposes of, of any kind of public exposure. We are working closely with the Public Health Agency of Canada to ensure we are providing accurate information, direction and advice to New Brunswickers. Our partners at Public Health Agency of Canada, along with the Office of the Chief Medical Officer of Health, along with our specialists in the uh, two regional health authorities, work together when we're putting together guidelines and information that's very technical uh, and medically oriented. So there are specialists at all these levels in these organizations. And when we get our directives and guidelines from the Public Health Agency of Canada, from their specialists and subject matter experts, then we then rework things in the province with our own epidemiologists and specialists in both regions. So we do work together to make sure that we have a common approach to many of the things around COVID-19. Provincial and federal authorities are in constant contact with the World Health Organization so we can provide guidance based on hard facts, evidence-tested protocols, and best practices learned in other jurisdictions where the pandemic is further advanced. And this information changes rapidly. And so you don't ever have to worry or wonder that the people, the specialists working in those organizations and the subject matter experts, they are completely in tune and in touch with all of that new information coming out. Vous devez absolument vous fier à ces sources d'information concernant la pandémie et rejeter tout ce que vous voyez et entendez en provenance de sources plus douteuses. Nous comptons sur les médias d'information locaux pour nous aider à transmettre des faits à la population du Nouveau-Brunswick et je tiens à vous remercier tout de votre collaboration à notre égard. It is very important that you rely on these sources of information regarding the pandemic and reject what you may see or hear coming from more dubious sources. Yesterday, a question was asked about Premier Higgs and I using the microphone. So with respect to what has happened in this room, for any of, any of the public, you might not know, but what I'm facing, the back wall that I'm facing, is usually filled with about 10 or 12 reporters and their cameras. So in that sh very small amount of space, there's no room to social distance. So we have removed all of the cameras except for three. We've removed all of the reporters except for three, and I think some of them are GNB staff, actually, so I think we only have one reporter from an outside organization. So, and then we have the interpreters standing here. Again, everybody's social distancing. This entire area is disinfected every single day. We do have hand sanitizer. GNB employees are now having their temperatures checked every single day before they come into the office building in some cases more than once a day. And, um, and again, we're all encouraged to wash our hands and not touch our face. And certainly if we have any symptoms or if we should be self-isolating because of travel, people are staying home. So in terms of how safe I feel that this environment is in terms of having a risk of exposure between the Premier and myself, I am not concerned about that based on all of the practices we have put in place in GNB and the same practices that we are encouraging people to put into place in other work environments. So I do appreciate the concern, um, but I do want to reassure you that everything that you see here is done in an appropriate and safe way. So the daily briefings are very important. And the information that we are providing is critical, as I know every question and answer provides much needed information to New Brunswickers. I, I, I get lots of feedback. I know that the government gets lots of feedback. I know that there are many venues for this information to be transmitted and, 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 a lot, and it reaches many, many people. Each and every one of us owes responsibility to the truth and particularly in this era of social media. And I brought up um, Dr. Nicole Leblanc, the chief of staff from Vitalité, and I'm quoting her because what she said was so eloquent and on point. She says, you know, we are battling the COVID-19 virus, but we're also battling a social virus. And that social virus can cause more problems than the actual virus itself. And I do agree with her. So that is why I'm making the, the statements and the suggestions today and the recommendations today around really tapping into credible sources of information. 
Be skeptical of what you see on the internet. Question sources. Look for the reliable and trusted information. I, I look at Dr. Teresa Tam's tweets every day. I follow uh, the Federal Minister of Health's tweets. Um, and, and obviously, I'm on telephone conversations with Dr. Tam three times a week uh, because we are in touch with the Public Health Agency of Canada, with the Special Advisory Committee, with the Chief Medical Officers of Health for the whole country. So we are all aware that life is changing. Some of you will not be able to visit sick and dying family members in the hospital, and the grieving process will be interrupted. And we've seen this in other jurisdictions, and this is really, really hard for everyone, but it's necessary. Je vous remercie de vous soucier de ma santé. De mon côté, je me soucie principalement de la façon dont nous informons la population. Nous demandons aux dirigeants de notre société, comme les maires, les conseillers, les chefs religieux et autres personnes en position de confiance, de renseigner la population avec franchise et de s'assurer de fournir de l'information crédible et exacte. Nous devons tous et chacun assumer nos responsabilités à l'égard de la vérité, particulièrement à l'ère des médias sociaux. I'd like to speak to an issue that has been getting significant attention on the media as well and online, whether or not people should wear protective masks. So there are some opinions out there and plenty of conflicting information. I know the World Health Organization is saying one thing, the CDC is proposing perhaps introducing some other suggestions from the Public Health Agency of Canada and Dr. Theresa Tam and, and, and the Federal Minister of Health. What we are saying on this topic is if you are a healthy individual, the use of a mask, and you're not a healthcare worker, the use of a mask is not recommended for preventing the spread of COVID-19. Healthcare workers have their own protocols and, and um, directives and guidelines around uh, use of protective, uh, personal protective equipment. But a healthy individual in the public does not necessarily need a mask. But, and the reason why is because there's a few things. You can, you can wear a mask when you're not ill, but it may give you a false sense of security. There may be a potential risk of infection with improper mask use and disposable, disposal. And masks are also needed to be changed frequently. But if your healthcare provider was recommending that you wear a mask because you were experiencing symptoms of COVID-19 while you were seeking or waiting for care, then in this instance, masks are an appropriate part of infection prevention and control measures. And the masks act as a barrier and help stop the tiny droplets from spreading when you cough or sneeze. As the course of this pandemic shifts, my advice may change. So I will make sure that you have the best information that I can provide. And the other thing about the homemade masks, my mom actually te texted me a picture of herself this morning because she likes to sew and she did make herself a homemade mask and she showed me the picture of it. And there were two gaping holes on either side. So the advice about homemade masks, I said, mom, it's a beautiful mask. It had bumblebees and flowers on it, but there's two gaping holes on either side. So she said, well, that was my prototype. I'll, I'll, I'll adjust it and change it. So yes, you can adjust it and change it and make sure there's no no holes on either side. And so she will. Um, in this instance, uh, of, as a court, uh, sorry. So, and also we've had questions about telecare service. So we are currently receiving about 450 calls per day to the 811 line, of which about half are related to COVID-19. We are receiving about 45 calls per day from people who fit the current criteria for testing. And keep in mind that our focus remains on testing the right people at the right time to slow the spread of the virus and protect those most in need of protection. If you have questions about your symptoms, I urge you to call your family doctor and arrange a virtual appointment or other providers such as E, Visits and B website for direction and guidance. There have also been questions about how we are working on counting confirmed cases. A positive case is registered according to the individual's place of residence, which may be different from where their last test was conducted, and I spoke to that earlier. So this applies to students, prison inmates, and members of the Canadian Armed Forces, and any other person who is temporarily a resident of New Brunswick. I want you to trust the information that you are receiving, and I need you to reject information that is not credible or accurate. And when I am telling you that staying home will save lives, I am telling you the truth. Vous devez être en mesure de vous fier à l'information que vous recevez. Je vous demande de rejeter, rejeter toute information qui n'est pas fiable ou exacte. Quand je vous dis que le fait de demeurer à la maison permettra de sauver la vie, je vous dis la vérité. When I tell you that maintaining physical distance and keeping your public interactions brief will slow the spread of this virus, I am telling you the truth. 
And when I tell you that we need to give priority to ensuring that those who will protect all of us need protection, I am telling you the truth. And again, I've spoken about my pre previous experience as a clinician and my frontline work with people who are who still work in front lines right now. So the doctors and nurses and anybody else who's working in the front lines, the risk to them is there. The fear for them is there. I have experienced it in the past myself, so I do understand, except this is a pandemic and this is a virus that we've never been exposed to before. So let's work together so that the truth does not become yet another casualty of the COVID-19 pandemic. Travaillons ensemble pour faire en sorte que la vérité ne devienne pas une autre victime de la pandémie de COVID-19. Thank you very much. Merci. Good afternoon. Bonjour. New Brunswick healthcare workers, like healthcare workers across Canada and around the world, are truly on the front line of this pandemic. While they are preparing and dealing with the impacts of COVID-19, these dedicated professionals are also doing their regular work. In hospitals, nursing homes, special care homes, and communities across New Brunswick, our healthcare workers are taking care of those who need them. I, along with all New Brunswickers, appreciate and thank them. Le travailleur de la santé de New Brunswick, comme le travailleur de la santé du Canada et de partout dans le monde, sont vraiment en première ligne de cette pandémie. Alors qu'ils se préparent pour faire face au impact de la COVID-19, ces professionnels dévoués vont aussi leur travail régulier. Dans les hôpitaux, les foyers de soins, les foyers de soins spéciaux, et les communautés de partout au Nouveau-Brunswick, nos travailleurs de la santé prennent soin des gens qui ont besoin d'eau. Les, les gens de Nouveau-Brunswick, tout comme moi, apprécient leur engagement et nous voulons leur dire un gros merci. Our healthcare workers are there for us always and we need to be there for them. We must all take whatever steps we can to keep them safe and healthy, not just today, but in the weeks to come. By taking steps to protect our healthcare workers, we are also protecting our province's most vulnerable residents, including our seniors. We have seen the devastating results that can occur if we are not vigilant or if we don't act quickly enough. Today, government has provided additional directives to all nursing homes in the province. The objective of these measures is to continue the care and ensure the security of our seniors. We are requiring every worker to be screened for symptoms and have their temperature taken. We will take every measure possible to protect our seniors. In addition to these measures, aligned with our efforts to reduce people entering nursing homes, training has been provided and the homes equipped to test any residents that are symptomatic. En adoptant des mesures pour protéger nos travailleurs de la santé, nos partageons protégeront aussi les résidents les plus vulnérables de notre province, incluant les années. Nous constatons les efforts dévastateurs qui peuvent s'y produire si nous ne sommes pas vigilants ou si nous n'assistions pas assez rapidement. Aujourd'hui, le gouvernement a fourni des directeurs supplémentaires à tous les foyers de soins de la province. Ces mesures ont pour objectif de continuer à fournir les soins à nos aînés et à assurer leur sécurité. Dès maintenant, les travailleurs feront l'objet d'un despétage des symptômes et on prendra le température. Nous allons prendre toutes les mesures possibles pour protéger nos aînés. Et plus de ces mesures et en plus de nos efforts pour réduire le nombre de personnes qui entrent dans des foyers de soins. Les travailleurs ont reçu une formation et les foyers de soins ont été équipés pour tester les résidents qui présentent Presentant des symptoms. We must do whatever we can to flatten the curve while preparing for what has to come. I want to thank the St. John Regional Hospital Foundation for its donation of life-saving equipment that will make a difference in our province during this crisis. The foundation asked what was needed and then they stepped up to assist by purchasing two portable specialized pieces of life support equipment. As COVID-19 is a respiratory illness, lung capacity and function can be severely affected. These machines oxygenate the blood and give the lungs a rest. 
This was possible thanks to the many generous donations to the Foundation's New Brunswick COVID-19 Emergency Fund. And is just one example of how the people in this province are coming together to support one another. We are currently working on options to ensure job protections are in place for those who are unable to work because they're requiring to self-isolate, are quarantined, or are caring for a family member who is ill with COVID-19. The anxiety and stress of dealing with this virus should not be amplified by worries about losing your job. When more details are available, we will share them with you. Nous travaillons présentement sur des options pour voir des mesures de protection des emplois pour les gens qui ne peuvent pas travailler parce qu'ils doivent s'auto-isoler parce qu'ils sont en quarantaine ou parce qu'ils doivent prendre soin de membres de leur famille qui a contradicté la COVID-19. L'anxiété et le stress causé par ce virus ne devra pas être amplifié par la peur de perdre votre emploi. Quand nous aurons plus le détail, nous le partageons avec nous. We are continuing to work with the federal government on establishing programs to protect New Brunswickers and to work at a provincial level to fill in any gaps we find. We encourage everyone who has a need to take advantage of the help that is available. I wanted to take a moment to update to update each of you on the number of applications the Red Cross has received from the New Brunswick Workers Emergency Income Benefit. This $900 benefit is intended to bridge the gap until federal EI benefits are available. To date, more than 50,000 people have registered. This number illustrates just how critical this program is for the workers and self-employed people who have lost their jobs due to the state of emergency. We will continue to find ways to cover any gaps to protect our workers and our economy. While it is important we protect those who have lost their jobs due to COVID-19, it is also key that we take steps to protect those who continue to provide essential services. Agriculture, aquaculture, fishy, fishing, and processing operations are essential services and are permitted to continue. However, workplaces mu must take measures to limit the spread of COVID-19. I thank New Brunswickers farmers, harvesters, aquaculturalists, and processors for their dedication in providing high quality and safe products to families across the province and in these critical times. C'est important de protéger les personnes qui ont perdu leur emploi en raison de la COVID-19. Mais c'est aussi essentiel de prendre des mesures pour protéger les personnes qui continuent à fournir des services essentiels. L'agriculture, l'aquaculture, les pêches et les activités de transformation sont des services essentiels qui sont autorisés à ces poursuivre. Cependant, les lois de travail doivent adopter des mesures pour limiter la propagation de la COVID-19. Je remercie les fermiers, les pêcheurs, les aquacultures et les transformateurs de New Brunswick pour leur devoir à leur qu'ils offrent des produits sécuritaires de grande qualité aux familles de la province et cette période difficile. In addition, as I mentioned earlier, our healthcare workers are critical. I also want to express gratitude to all of those working in health and in senior care, in particular in food service, custodians, and all the frontline workers. Special thanks also goes to those who ensure our grocery stores are stocked and are, and are operating, from the truck divers to those working on checkouts, and the list goes on and on. I thank you on behalf of a grateful province. You play an important role in keeping New Brunswick healthy and keeping us moving. We continue to work with these sectors to address challenges as they arise. Yesterday, I confirmed we have extended our provincial declaration of emergency measures for an additional 14 days. Today, I can add that we have also revised our mandatory order under the Emergency Measures Act. These orders give the force of law to the, to the, in the need to flatten the curve. Here's what's new today. Campgrounds have been added to this list of business operations that are permitted from, business, uh, from admitting patrons during the emergency measures timeframe. The owners and managers of premises that permit the seasonal docking of multiple recreation vessels must either prohibit recreational vessels docking or take steps to ensure minimum interaction of people. These seasonal operations often involve significant socializing as part of the experience 
and we can't have that right now. We'll revisit these rules regularly. Owners and occupiers of land are now responsible to take all reasonable steps to prevent social or recreational gatherings. We don't have to, we don't have to close completely every green space or beach, but anyone who decides to keep one open is responsible to stop gatherings. We have banned open fires all this month with only a few ex exceptions. We're starting to see fires in some parts of the province and our first responders can't be chasing runaway fires this month. We have made adjustments to our new border controls points to allow people to get to work, to see their children and to access necessities. Finally, the order now prohibits anyone knowingly approaching within two meters of another person, accepting the members of their household and accepting as needed for work. This is directed straight at the small number of people who still see, who we just don't respect the physical distancing requirements. Those who don't follow advice and who won't respond to warnings now face the risk of being charged for violating the order. As Dr. Russell said, this pandemic is unlike anything we have experienced before. We know that people will continue to get sick and that some will likely die. These steps we take now as individuals and as a government have the power to make a difference. Comme le mentionné Dr. Russell, nous n'avons jamais été confrontés à une situation pareille. Nous savons que des autres personnes vont être malades et que certaines personnes vont mourir. Les mesures que nous adoptons maintenant et tant que personne mais aussi en tant que gouvernement ont le pouvoir de changer la situation. Stay safe, stay healthy, and stay at home. Check in with the loved ones through social media and phone calls. If you have to go out, keep two meters or six feet between you and others, and be kind to others and yourself. Even as we must remain physically distant, we are all in this together. Même si nous devons garder un certain distance physique, nous sommes tous solidaires. Thank you. Merci. Merci, Mr. Premier Minister. Thank you, Premier Higgs. Thank you, Dr. Russell. We will now proceed with questions from the media. Nous allons maintenant procéder aux questions des journalistes. Each reporter will have one question, and you are invited to ask your question in the official language of the choice, your choice. Chaque journaliste a une question, et vous êtes invité à poser vos questions dans la langue officielle de votre choix. Laura Brown, CTV. Uh, for either of you, Dr. Russell or uh, the Premier, um, I'm wondering, uh, there was a letter sent out to healthcare workers yesterday talking about an excessive use of PPEs. And um, I know that we've, I, I feel like we've gotten mixed messages on whether or not we really do have a good enough supply of PPEs. And when I spoke to some healthcare workers unions today, they felt the same way. Um, do we have a good supply? of PPEs at this point, and shouldn't we leave it to, I guess, healthcare professionals to decide if they should use something or not? So, Laura, that's a really, really great question, and I know it's on everyone's mind who is a frontline worker right now and who is, you know, has any patient contact. Um, and so the, there was a memo that was sent out on behalf of the New Brunswick Medical Society, the regional health authorities, Vitalite, Horizon, uh, as well as GNB and Office of the Chief. And it was drafted by the infectious disease specialists in both Horizon and Vitalite around their professional uh, opinion around what is judicious use of PPE. So each RHA has their um, guidelines and protocols and they're based on Public Health Agency of Canada guidelines. And we are also working with the unions uh, as well as WorkSafe in those conversations to make sure everybody arrives on the same page with respect to the advice around proper PPE use. And by proper, the professional judgment is in there. Um, I think it's that balance between uh, a stockpile that we know is not infinite, 
Uh, so, and I think that's a challenge across the country. We, we do have, I did mention yesterday that we are in talks with the federal government around procurement of more PPE. So my understanding is a shipment is on the way, but uh, as you noted in, in Quebec, they were burning through their PPE very quickly and they were gonna run out. So we have a non-infinite supply of PPE based on supply chains and based on shortages around the globe. So we have to be judicious and it has to be based on science. And so the best advice that we can offer at this point in time that we shared with our partners and continue to have conversations around uh, with um, all of the partners so that we can again all arrive on the same page with with respect to the balance of the judicious use following the guidelines having professional judgment play a part in that and understanding that again we, we have to face uh, many many weeks of this pandemic uh, months even and so there are some uncertainties there and so with the best knowledge that we have right now again this is our best advice and again with all the partners at the table having those conversations it is a perfect time to make sure that we're all aligned with the same messaging and so that is that is the goal thank you laura thank you doctor andrew Waugh, telegraph journal andrew yeah sorry about that no worries um uh Dr. Russell, my first question is for you. Um, my esteemed colleagues at Academe Nouvelle published a story today talking about the um, use of experimental potential, but also uh, somewhat uh, dubious uh, COVID-19 um, vaccine, I guess you would call it, or is it um, hydrochloric? whatever it's called, you know, you're the doctor. Um, can you talk to us about that, whether that's being used and what's going on? Yes, so uh, I'm aware that uh, this type of study is being done and uh, Again, the Public Health Agency of Canada has some uh, messaging around that, that, that there are research um, studies happening on that. My understanding from Vitalite that uh, the hydrochloroquine um, is going to be used actually in Vitalite and Horizon by pharmacists and ID uh, infectious disease specialists, they are collaborating to develop a clinical trial. And um, so the research teams in both Vitalite and Horizon are working together and they will have a registry to track the patient's results. And it is a clinical trial. So um, my understanding is they're meeting with the College of Physicians and Surgeons of New Brunswick and the New Brunswick College of Pharmacists this week to present the project. And my understanding is they're still working out the operational procedures on how to, how to secure medication for the trial and how to ensure safe medication dispensing to patients. Thank you, Andrew. Silas Brown, Global. Hi there. Uh, this one is for the uh, for the premier. Um, we've seen uh, an immense amount of pressure, um, particularly today, on the federal government to release their modeling numbers. And uh, we just saw in Ontario that Premier Ford has said that uh, there will be a full technical briefing um, tomorrow uh, with the modeling that the province has there. I know that uh, you said that we. We should see modeling from you guys by the end of the week. I, I, I want to know if that is still the plan, and, and if so, why do you believe that it is important to release this modeling to the public? Well, I actually think the more information that we can factually demonstrate and in, in, in project in real terms what we foresee is uh, is a value for, for people to be looking off the same information that, that we are. Uh, so I think that's important to do that, but it's always important to know that that you know although you can put all the modeling together, it, it's not a precise science. Uh, but we have a lot of other cases, I guess, in, in other parts of the world that you can you can kind of emulate to some degree. I, I am uh, you know this this furthers I guess my my uh, validation or concern that that we actually have consistency across our country. I'm on a call tonight with my uh, colleagues, uh, firstly with all the premiers, um, I think that's around four o'clock, and then later with the prime minister and the deputy prime minister and all the premiers uh, talking about, um, I guess, further measures and also further updates from the federal government. I, I believe that uh, we should be all sharing consistent information so that uh, everyone can see it. And, and, and I know that Ontario and, and uh, Quebec 
and, and maybe, maybe BC and Alberta are in different situations than we are, but nevertheless, uh, having a consistency of information and how it's interpreted, it will help us all make better decisions and it'll help us all learn from each other. Thank you, Silas. Thank you, Premier. Vicki Hogar. Sorry, can I just clarify one point? Um, uh, uh, I know that you had said that that was coming by the end of the week here. Is that still the plan to get that either today or tomorrow? We, we have met this week, uh, had several meetings on this. Uh, I would suggest that, you know, the possibility is tomorrow, but it's more likely early next week. Um, probably on uh, Tuesday range, but we are we are building, uh, you know, um, I guess a, a structure here to be sure that it has clarity, it has decisiveness, and and we can react uh, quickly in any parts of this province to deal with uh, an emergency situation that that could unfold to a greater extent than we we now have. Thank you, Vicki Hogarth, Charlotte County TV. Thanks, Dave. My question is for the premier. Victims of domestic violence who are in isolation with their abusers are at a greater risk for abuse, and this is exacerbated by the fact that alcohol sales across North America appear to be up right now. I spoke with workers at a local transition house this morning who expect to see an increase very shortly um, in use, also seeing any change in the services they're offering to meet the needs of this new normal. So how are you working with them to provide for some of our most vulnerable citizens who face a very different kind of threat right now? Well, I think the only thing I could say to that is I know that our Minister in Social Development is working very closely with, with different agencies throughout the province to recognize anything that's being, you know, not only ensuring we maintain the normal support, but anything that's out of the ordinary created by this crisis. So I would, um, you know, I'll have further discussions with the Minister of, of Social Development and, um, and provide whatever details that, um, that you require in that regard. Thank you, Vicky. Michel Corriveau, Radio Canada. Oui, bonjour. C'est une question pour uh, Dr. Russell. Je reviens sur uh, l'histoire du Black Mill hydroxychloroquine uh, qui va être utilisé à Georges Dumont et du côté de l'horizon aussi. Uh, même si dans d'autres provinces, on ne peut pas en faire un usage uh, généralisé. Là, j'aimerais savoir qu'est-ce que vous pensez de, de cet usage-là, uh, Dr. Russell? Est-ce que c'est un espoir uh, au niveau conduit? Vous voulez savoir quels sont mes sentiments, quelles sont mes pensées sur le, la recher les recherches que Vitalité et Horizon vont faire? Oui, mais ça, ça semble être des recherches qui sont faites, euh, qui sont faites de façon euh, plus large là, que ce qu'on voit ailleurs. Là. On va utiliser le test avec des gens qui sont affectés, euh, semble-t-il. J'aimerais savoir si vous savez exactement quest ce qui va être fait, si vous avez des détails là-dessus. Et est-ce que vous pensez que c'est une bonne chose et un espoir avec ça? Alors, je, ma connaissance de la, des de recherches qui vont, qui vont, euh, qui vont être faites euh, au Canada et ici au Nouveau-Brunswick euh, sur ce médicament, le hydrochloroquine, euh, euh, Horizon et Vitalité vont, vont travailler ensemble avec leurs pharmacistes et leurs euh, leur médecins d'infection. De, de euh, en collaboration pour développer les recherches, puis ils vont présenter leur projet au Collège des, des médecins et surgents de, de Nouveau-Brunswick et aussi le Collège de pharmacistes du Nouveau-Brunswick. Alors, euh, ça va ça, dans les, les recherches, ils vont avoir une manière d'informer de, de, de les patients et voir ce qui sont les, les développements avec les patients. Et ils vont... Euh, ça, c'est tout en collaboration ensemble. Et après ça, euh, la manière qu'ils vont faire tous les détails, ça, ça va arriver après qu'ils présentent les recherches, le, le, le boss de la recherche à, à, à les deux collèges. Merci, Michel. Elizabeth Fraser. Hi there. My question is for Dr. Russell. Um, you spoke earlier about a church community in the province with five confirmed cases. When did the gathering of the church members take place and how many people were present? So the information that I have right now from my regional medical officer of health is around the number of cases and the number of contacts that have been traced and then the people that are uh, under investigation right now. So I only have the dates uh, in front of me around when they were diagnosed. Can you tell us what church or in what area that church is located? Well, as I've said before, with everybody 
every new diagnosis, every new case that's diagnosed, the process is going to be the same. So the public health nurses in the regions will do the contact tracing, find out where the individual had been, uh, identify those close contacts. If there had been a workplace or an institutional exposure, they will notify that organization uh, directly. And if there are any public exposures, then I would be announcing those. And, and uh, as I mentioned earlier, we will be announcing, um, we will be putting that information on the website so people can find it there uh, in and, moving forward. And just another and, question, if this happened after the emergency declaration, was the church fined at all? I just have the information in front of me around the dates that the people were diagnosed. Okay. Thank you, Elizabeth. Travis Fortnum, Global. My question is for the Premier, and it's about municipal parks. Uh, we've now determined it's up to the municipalities themselves whether they remain open. And, but earlier this week, the Premier said that uh, he expected them to follow the province's lead. And now we, uh, he said that we believe that it's okay. I'm wondering what changed and why municipal parks aren't covered by the declaration of emergency measures as they are in other provinces. Well, in fact, they are covered by the emergency measures, and, and we've been speaking with the uh, the municipalities and as a, as a group and, and basically expecting them to enforce the same rules. Um, I, I'm saying in, in some municipalities it may be easier. They're, they're not necessarily fenced off. They're not necessarily able to close them per se uh, or have the capability, but they can certainly monitor them. Um, we've actually decided that we would have our public safety officers offer to work with the municipalities to provide some surveillance from our officers uh, to ensure that the compliance is is um, is is upheld. So under you're, you're correct. Under the Emergency Measures Act, we do have the authority to uh, to exercise that um, those those requirements in the municipalities. Thank you, Kevin Bissett, Canadian Press. And the question for uh, Dr. Russell, Dr. Russell, I just want to be clear on you're talking about the use of the PPEs earlier. Um, if a nurse now wants to wear an N95 mask. Uh, are they able to do that? And if not, what needs to change before we get to that point where they are? So in the documents from the Public Health Agency of Canada, that those are the guidance documents that each RHA has used to form their, um, their approach within the RHAs. And they have very specific guidelines around when N95s are used. There's two situations where they're used. One is in an environment where an, an aerosol generating procedure is being done, and there's very clear definition of what that means. And then also at a point of care assessment, uh, when an N95 mask would be required is if there, the person had very severe symptoms uh, or if there was a risk of escalation to needing to do an, an aerosolized, um, uh, aerosol generating medical procedure. So there is clinical judgment uh, used in that case and that is what the, the Public Health Agency of Canada guidelines say. And then within each health authority, they have uh, their guidelines are based on that. And then, as I mentioned, there is a memo that went out this week uh, that was drafted by the uh, infectious disease specialists from both the RHAs, um, just highlighting the fact that, again, we need to be judicious about our use of PPE. We do not have an indefinite supply, so we, we just have to be really careful about that judgment and, and when, in fact, to use the proper PPE for the right situation, for the right patients. Thank you, Kevin. Matthew Guacomo, La Cadie Nouvelle. Bonjour, ma question pour Mme Russell. Je veux bien faire attention de ne pas euh, répéter de fausses informations qui circulent sur les médias sociaux, mais pourriez-vous euh, peut-être répéter en français ce que vous avez dit en anglais tout à l'heure concernant la conversation que vous avez eue avec la docteur euh, Leblanc de Vitality et puis la, la façon dont les cas sont attribués euh, euh, selon l'endroit où les gens sont testés ou l'endroit où les gens habitent? Sachant qu'il n'y a toujours pas de cas dans la zone nord-est. Euh, oui, elle voulait, elle, voulait, elle voulait passer le message que hier, j'avais annoncé qu'avant, on, on avait les codes postaux des gens et les tests étaient euh, à, euh, attribués à l'endroit où ils demeuraient. Mais ce n'est plus le cas. Maintenant, les, les, les tests qu'on fait, les échantillons, les dépistages, c'est annoncé, c'est rapporté selon où le test a été fait et non pas où la personne demeure. Si. Est-ce qu'il y avait un autre, est-ce qu'il y avait quelque chose d'autre qui voulait clarifier? 
Euh, oui, ben, vous avez euh, fait allusion euh, à, à Caraquette où il n'y a toujours pas de cas, et dans le Nord-Est où il n'y a toujours pas de cas. Euh, Qu'est-ce qu'on va faire avec la, la, la possibilité là, que les gens se fassent tester où ils n'habitent pas et donc euh, que, que, que des, des, des gens, euh, je ne sais pas, voyagent entre l'endroit où ils sont testés et l'endroit où ils habitent vraiment? Est-ce qu'on peut vraiment se fier aux chiffres que vous donnez dans ce cas-là? Ben, le message est toujours que vous devrez rester à la maison sauf que faire des épiceries et les choses nécessaires et prendre une marche. Alors, la protection de la population entièrement du Nouveau-Brunswick, ça dépend sur le monde resté à la maison. Alors, n'importe quel test qu'on fait, n'importe quel diagnostic qu'on fait, les contacts, etc., c'est impératif. C'est absolument impératif que les gens restent à la maison. C'est la seule protection qu'on peut vraiment vous donner contre ce virus. Daniel McCready, CBC. Hi there, my question is for the Premier. Um, this is a question about daycares, uh, but for the children of regular people, not essential workers, um, in Nova Scotia, early childhood educators are still getting paid, and parents with children in licensed centers are not having to pay fees or losing their spots. Um, but the opposite is happening here in New Brunswick. I was just wanted to know why you're allowing that to happen. Well, I guess that, uh, you know, we've rolled out what we consider as a, a very uh, responsible daycare uh, situation for essential workers. Um, and we believe if, if um, someone is, is able to be at home with their family and, and stay at home with their family, that's, 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 that's great. And, and um, the obligation is, is there at this time, especially. Um, in relation to them paying for, uh, if they're able to pay for it, if they're still, gonna, they're, they're still receiving their pay and they want to maintain their space, Uh, we've seen day, daycares closed down, and in the cases where they've laid off their people, those people are covered under under the, the employment program and certainly under our GAP program. But if uh, the, uh, the individuals want to maintain their space in their daycare, that's between them and the daycare. It wouldn't be like any other different uh, situation. We think that's fair. They have an opportunity to call and talk uh, with others. There's a number to do that. But, um, you know, this isn't about trying to... Uh, Um, emulate what everyone else does and we're, we're all different to some degree. I'll go back to the standardization model that, that I'd like to see nationally because um, you know we can go all across this country and find somebody doing something differently. We feel our measures are appropriate, responsible and, and, and they're effective. Thank you, Danielle. Adam Harris, Telegraph Journal. Uh, thank you. Premier, you touched on it a little, but regarding your conference call with the Prime Minister and uh, other premiers tonight, do you, uh, do you plan to make any specific requests or bring up any specific issues on that call? Yes, um, I, I do. And, and I guess just in, in to a, a few would be in relation to the consistency across the, the country. I mean, I think we're seeing, you know, people that are, are um, let's say, peaking earlier than others. And, and hopefully we, we won't experience that, but we're, we're planning for that and expecting to. Um, but again, it's the supplies. I mean, every province is, is, um, is concerned about the level of supplies that are available to our healthcare workers and to workers in any field that need, need protection. And that's why it's so important that we utilize the right supplies at the right time. So supplies, and I know the, the conversations to date have been related to a national strategy, and, and, um, and a supplies available, availability is based on you know, our per capita basis. And so that's why it's important that we have consistency across the country in the standards of utilization. Uh, the other areas that I'm, I'm certainly very concerned about um, would be in, in relation to some of the, uh, I guess, the, the, the standards we put in place on the cross-border, how that, how's, that, how's that working or being consistent. Some of the standards that we found or some of the issues we found in the gaps of, uh, in, you know, if I think about the $900 gap that we put, uh, we filled, you know, we've had 50,000 applicants. Um, that, that is a big cost that we did primarily to offset Uh, the timing that it took for the federal government to put in a program that was going to be a rapid response. So uh, we are looking at this as um, a disaster. We will be keeping you know, records of all this funding that we are spending as a province, and we're, we're anticipating this will be treated like any other disaster where the, the federal government will look at, at the end of the day, what we've had to spend, particularly for this, this disaster. Thank you, Adam. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we do have time for very quick follow-up question for everybody. So, Laura Brown, do you have a follow-up question? Yes, super quick. Um, the testing kits at St. John Regional uh, Hospital Foundation is 
uh, helping out with. Um, can you uh, kind of talk a little bit about those? And are they are they going to help with the points that we get to when we're doing some more widespread community uh, testing? Yes, absolutely. So that was a plan that was worked out in conjunction with the Department of Health, and um, those machines, they're called Gen Expert. Uh, we're looking at rolling that out late next week, perhaps Thursday, and they will be available in eight of the regional labs. Um, the daily capacity in each is around um, between, you know, for the smaller centers, maybe 16 a day, up to the larger centers, 84 a day. Uh, more details about that will, will be available as we get them, but that is the preliminary information that we have right now, and it is a very positive development. Thank you, Laura. Andrew, why? Um, Dr. Russell, we're um, just, you know, maybe an hour away from crossing over into a million cases worldwide. Um, I'd just like you to talk about that moment for a second, if you don't mind, and what potentially you think is coming for New Brunswick. Well, Andrew, I have been watching the situation evolve since the early days of, of things going on in China, because when you're a public health practitioner and you're connected to the Public Health Agency of Canada and the World Health Organization, my inbox gets filled daily with reports from around the world of things emerging. So when that situation started to emerge in China and it became clear that it was going to affect more and more countries in, in very dramatic ways, certainly hitting a million cases is obviously a, a milestone and, and a very dramatic one and, and an, I want to say an ominous one, but this thing is marching around the globe and it, it really does know no bounds. And um, so with that knowledge available for a while now, the measures that we have in place now, I'm, I'm very happy about. Um, I do hope that people take this as seriously as we are trying to convey around staying home because we don't have any protection against this virus. There is nothing to protect us against this virus with respect to our immune systems. We, this is a novel virus that until we get a vaccine 18 months from now, hopefully, again, nobody can even predict that, uh, we have a lot of hurdles internationally to overcome. And we still, in New Brunswick, have the opportunity to flatten the curve. And so that brings me hope and optimism, but I also know that the fear and anxiety is there because there are so many things that are unpredictable and uncertain at this time. So we've talked about modeling at the national level, we've talked about modeling at the provincial level, and these are numbers. And sometimes reality is not the same as what is projected in numbers. So all we can do right now is work as hard as we can together collectively to fight this and our success depends on that collective approach. That's really the only way to get through this. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, Andrew. Silas Brown, do you have a follow-up? Silas? Uh, no, actually, I'm good. Laura, Laura asked my question. Thank you, Silas. Vicki Hogarth, do you have a follow-up? Thanks, I do. Uh, my question is for Premier Higgs. Uh, earlier this week, you reported that I think there were upwards of 250 investigations into potentially non-compliant businesses. Have any of these investigations confirmed cases of workplace non-compliance? And if so, how are they being penalized or dealt with? I think we found, um, we found out of the whole group about 94 non-compliances. And, and at this point, all of those are, are now in compliance. And we continue to monitor that. At that time, I think there was over 2,500 businesses looked at. Maybe that number is not right, but but they're all in compliance at this point, And we continue to survey uh, with our officers um, to ensure that that continues, not only for those companies, but but in other companies as well. Thank you. Okay, Michelle Corriveau. Oui, une question pour Dr. Russell. Trois chiffres. J'aimerais savoir juste trois chiffres. Le nombre d'hospitalisations de personnes. The person is guaranteed and the number of transmission in the community is confirmed and is under enquête. J'ai cette information devant moi. C'est juste sur un morceau de papier, mais je vais le trouver. On a confiance. Oui. Merci. 
Ben, ça dépend que je le trouve. OK. Alors, vous demandez combien de gens qui sont hospitalisés? Oui. Hospitalisation, les nombres de guéris de transmission dans les communautés confirmées et sous enquête. OK. Alors, moi, je croyais que ce, toute cette information va être donnée aux médias et aussi euh, chaque jour. Est-ce que ce n'est pas le cas? Parce qu'il y avait une journée qu'on a fait un briefing euh, tout, totalement technique. Anyway. Je, je, alors, aujourd'hui, on a 22 cas qui sont récupérés. On a euh, trois cas qui sont dans l'hôpital euh, et je crois qu'un de ces cas est, est dans le, les soins intensifs. Et au sujet de la transmission dans la communauté, je crois qu'il y en a trois cas. Oui, je vois ici, c'est trois cas. Et il y en a 14 qui sont encore sous inv investigation. Thank you, Michelle. Merci, Michelle. Elizabeth, Elizabeth Fraser, do you have a follow-up? Hi there. Yes, I do. Um, so, my question is for Dr. Russell. You said that there are three patients who are currently in hospital now. Um, can you provide their condition? I know that you have said that no one is in ICU, but can you can you be a bit more specific? Oh, I actually did say that one person was in ICU. So the, okay, so one person is in ICU. Right. So the thing is, is that what we know about COVID-19 is that 80% of people will have mild to moderate symptoms and be able to self-isolate at home and be treated at home. We know roughly, and, and these, these percentages vary, but you know, 20% or so um, could be hospitalized because they were more sick uh, and required more care. And we know that a certain percentage of those people will require ICU. So right now, um, obviously, if they required hospitalizations, they are more seriously ill than somebody who could be treated at home. Thank you, Elizabeth. Travis, do you have a follow-up? Kevin Bissett, do you have a follow-up? Mathieu Wakomo, la question nouvelle, as-tu une question suivie? Oui, ma question est pour Monsieur le Premier ministre Higgs. Est-ce que c'est toujours prévu que l'Assemblée législative reprenne ses travaux mardi et euh, de quoi on va discuter si l'Assemblée revient vraiment mardi? Uh, no, at this time, the uh, First Nations Assembly you're referring to? Oh, the legislature. No, we're not uh, planning to sit, although I'll be talking. I'll be talking that over with my colleagues um, in, today, tomorrow, to determine if they... Uh, if they wish to sit, but right now I'm going to recommend that we do not come back on the, on the 7th and we'll defer it until a, a later date. Merci, Mathieu. Daniel McCready, do you have a follow-up? Um, yeah, just a kind of clarification around the um, nursing home workers' measures to, to make sure that they're um, safe at work. So are they going to have their temperature taken like before they start their shift? Yes, I, that's my understanding. Adam Harris, do you have a follow-up? Adam Harris? Merci beaucoup tout le monde. Thank you very much, everybody. This ends today's briefing. Ça termine cette conférence de presse. Merci.